This week, I would like to talk about delusional disorder. I actually very clearly remember the first person I met that had delusional disorder. It was a lady, probably early 60s, and she was talking about the man with the red hat who she believed had, the woman with the red hat, who she believed had been the lover of her husband who, has, who had passed away. And it was, it was amazing to listen to her because it just, this woman with the red hat could weave herself into the story in the life at any number of times. She was, as the description of delusional disorder goes, she was well organized and seemed to be functional in most aspects of her life. But there was a lot of impact of this belief of this woman with the red hat. And back in those days of medical studenthood, my attending doctors were trying to get her well and not succeeding. Since that time, I've had several other, met several other people with delusional disorder, and I have found what I think is traditionally spoken with in our circles about delusional disorder. It seems to be difficult to treat. And yet it still can cause tremendous distress and actually impairment of life quality and eventually um, functional and occupational concerns. So I think it's worthwhile to talk about it, and I think it's especially worthwhile because it's hardly talked about. There are, for example, relatively uncommon, the latest estimates vary, but it's around uh, 0.1 to 0.2 percent for lifetime prevalence, meaning between 1 in 500 to 1 in 1,000 people will develop it during the course of a life. So uncommon. Coupled, I think, with the biggest problem, that there are not FDA-approved treatments for delusional disorder. And as I think you know, and if you don't, you'll realize this as soon as I say it, with, unless there's a pharmaceutical company that has an approved drug, there's really no marketing effort devoted toward making clinicians aware of a particular disease state. And certainly, um, nobody has any budget to promote off-label treatments. So it just doesn't get discussed very much in modern journal articles or conferences and uh, CME activities, which are oftentimes funded one way or another by pharmaceutical companies. So we know very little about it. And I think a lot of most clinicians that I speak with struggle, as I do, in trying to find adequate solutions to improve life quality in people that are affected by this. In doing their work for this presentation, I reached out to a one of the few leading researchers in the field. Um, I didn't ask ahead of time to use the statement, so I don't attribute it to any particular person. But in his response to me, he said, you know, this is a very understudied disorder with very little in the way of evidence-based treatment. And I will try to convey to you what I think are some important points and what I can gather would be the best ideas for treatment, at least in terms of pharmacotherapy. Let's start off with delusions. Since this is a delusional disorder, let's talk about what a delusion is. According to DSM-5, it is a fixed belief not amenable to change in light of conflicting evidence. And some other definitions that are in the literature go on to say that this fixed belief not amenable to change is also to paraphrase, somewhat unusual or bizarre, not in line with cultural cultural norms of beliefs. Um, but this is, according to DSM-5, the official definition, which, as an aside, I just want to bring up for consideration, what about beliefs like this? I have not accomplished anything useful in my life, might say a woman who's actually founded two companies and employs hundreds of people. Uh, Aaron Beck actually wrote about this kind of thought in his writings about cognitive behavior therapy. And in my work with people, this is a very common kind of belief in people with depression. And I find it to be quite difficult to dissuade somebody from these beliefs. So it seems to be fixed, and it seems to be not really altered by evidence to the contrary. So we call that cognitive distortion, but how different is it really from delusion, I wonder. Uh, similarly, you know, everybody's going to laugh at me. We'll say somebody who's given lots of talks always thinks somebody's going to laugh at him despite nobody ever has. So these are, these are common enough in, well, in depression and anxiety. These are extremely common disorders, and these beliefs are very common in these common disorders. So it's just interesting, I think, that we don't label these delusions, and the mind can think of a lots of things to think about uh, as to why that is. But 
coming back to the key topic, delusional disorder. So now that we've talked about delusion, what is the definition of delusional disorder? It is the, simply the presence of a delusion, one or more delusions for one month or longer. Interestingly, according, notably, according to DSM, it can't meet the criteria for criterion A for schizophrenia, which are here. So it has to be isolated and relatively mild, shall we say, and not accompanied by hallucinations, hallucinations disorganized speech, grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior, and so forth. And paraphrasing DSM, the delusion has to be relatively minor. It doesn't impact markedly the functional ability of a person or their relationships, and it's not considered obviously bizarre or odd. So I'll leave it at that without editorial editorializing. That's the gist of the definition of delusional disorder. And then I want to talk about is this DSM actually puts delusional disorder in the chapter on schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorders. I think that's the title of the chapter. The point being that DSM-5, and thus speaking for the American Psychiatric Association, seems to want to fit delusional disorder as part of a schizophrenia scheme. And some of that makes sense. It is, I mean, as you've seen in Criterion A from two slides ago, delusions are one of the defining features of psychosis. Psychosis by itself is interesting because it doesn't have a, an official operational definition in the DSM, but it looks like as close as DSM comes to explicitly defining what it means by psychosis, then delusion and hallucination would be the things. So delusions are part of psychosis and antipsychotic medications help at least some people. So those are some things in favor of viewing delusional disorder as part of a schizophrenia spectrum. However, People have observed, and you've probably seen, that in schizophrenia treatment, when we give antipsychotic medications, typically the first symptom to resolve is hallucination, followed very closely, almost synchronously, with uh, improving thought organization or reducing disorganization of thought and behavior. Delusions oftentimes get better, but they tend to resolve on a slower time course and over the course of typically months, and in some cases don't really fully ever go away, despite the fact hallucinations often do. So that the differing time course in response to the same drug suggests maybe a somewhat different pathophysiology. The I think a really important thing that needs to be thought about in future work, if anybody's going to do future work, is this, that in schizophrenia or in schizotypal personality disorder or in schizoaffective disorder, you'll find that affected individuals, if you look at their family members, you will see that schizophrenia-related diagnoses are overrepresented. There's a clustering of these conditions within families. However, if you just get people with delusional disorder and examine their family trees, you find that schizophrenia or schizophrenia spectrum diagnoses are not overrepresented. So that suggests a different genetic pattern, which I didn't get all the data, but one of the papers that I read pointed out that genetic studies, as they reviewed them, didn't find any, any significant overlap between the genes corresponding to delusional disorder risk and the genes associated with schizophrenia. So there's that interesting piece. Also, epidemiology of delusional disorder is substantially different than schizophrenia spectrum conditions like schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, schizotypal personality, and so forth. These conditions tend to make their debut in late teens or early adulthood. In late teens and early adulthood, they tend to affect men more often than women, and men are affected more severely than women on average. However, with delusional disorder, the age of onset is much later, typically in the fourth decade of life, and there's a uh, the, the male female occurrence is skewed more toward women. Some estimates say that the ratio is four to three women to men that are likely to be diagnosed with delusional disorder. So different pattern of onset or different epidemiology um, altogether. Things that are different, and finally, as we led, as I led in the beginning, 
antipsychotic medications, at least in clinical practice, seem to be not nearly as effective in delusional disorder as in schizophrenia, although data I'll show you later might cause us to reconsider that idea if you're a person who has that idea. Um, so these are strikes against the idea that delusional disorder is a form of schizophrenia. However, to make it even more unclear or interesting, this study, I love these kinds of studies by um, Oliver Howe is one of the people who's consistently involved in these, looking at positron emission tomography to measure to probe dopamine functioning in living human brains with various kinds of psychiatric conditions. In this 2020 published study, they gave um, DOPA, which is a dopamine precursor, and it was labeled with um, with, fluor with fluoride 18, fluorine 18. So eight, fluorine 18 emits positrons. It's a form of radioactivity, and that makes it good so that you can detect it. You can put people into positron emission scanners and measure their positron emissions. And if you organize the cameras just right, you can actually construct two-dimensional images or three-dimensional images of where the radioactivity signal is coming from. So very cool. And using a positron-emitting dopamine precursor, you can simply estimate the ability of a brain region to create dopamine out of dopa. So they're, they're estimating dopamine synthesis capacity. Typical of this kind of study, and the, this group has reported this several times, if you compare the dopamine synthetic capacity of the healthy control group, you'll see that individuals with schizophrenia, on average, have a much higher ability to make dopamine. Other studies with other techniques show that these individuals not only make more dopamine on average, but they release more dopamine when dopamine is released. And so this is to those who say, where is the evidence of this chemical imbalance? The you know, critics of psychiatry say that we can't really show these, these alleged chemical imbalances, which, by the way, is a term I hate. But you know, the, the general point is that some critics say we can't demonstrate these, these alleged chemical abnormalities. Well, there it is. And it's consistent with what drugs tell us, that people with schizophrenia are making too much dopamine, they're releasing too much dopamine. That's related, it seems, to the experience of psychosis because if you give drugs that either inhibit dopamine synthesis, inhibit dopamine release, or block the dopamine signal at the dopamine receptor, then you get therapeutic response. And Oliver Howe and colleagues using this kind of methodology have actually shown that these high dopamine synthesizers are the ones who get better with dopamine-blocking drugs. And they've also shown that this, this group who are not high dopamine synthesizers, they tend to not get better with dopamine blocking drugs. So this is a this technique confirms what drugs have been telling us for a long time. It's nice to know. But look at this. Um, they, they included in this study 11 individuals with recently diagnosed delusional disorder. And looking at the average of dopamine synthetic capacity, it's significantly, statistically significantly higher than the comparison healthy control group. There is obviously some overlap at the higher end with uh, people with schizophrenia and other psychoses. So this data suggests that delusional disorder is a hyperdopamine syndrome. I would, at this moment, clarify or refine that, that conclusion of theirs and say that some people, like these folks with delusional disorder, appear to be good dopamine or above average dopamine synthesizers. However, these folks are pretty much the same as the control group in terms of dopamine synthesis. To my way of thinking, that explains why some people with delusional disorder do get good response from dopamine blocking drugs and others appear not to. Um, so there's that. That's it's, as I said in the beginning, it's an understudied disorder with a lack of really clear evidence-based treatment, but these are some pieces of data that I think are worth considering, and I think particularly looking at this distribution of dopamine helps to generate some theories about treatment. So moving on to treatment, this is where it gets sad. Cochrane Group did a comprehensive search before 2012. They published their findings in 2012. And they looked, as they always do, very hard for everything that was relevant to delusional disorder, trying to find 
randomized controlled trials on which to opine about evidence, they found essentially nothing, I mean, no, literally nothing, in randomized controlled trials for medications. In their search, they found only one trial that was randomized and controlled, and that was cognitive behavior psychotherapy versus supportive psychotherapy. And, and it's extremely small sample size, and unfortunately, they didn't really comment on the outcome of delusions. They did, they did say that CBT was more helpful than supportive psychotherapy at um, self-esteem. So in terms of randomized controlled trials, there's nothing there. And between 2012 and now, there's still nothing there in randomized controlled trials for drugs. If you look into this literature or if you talk to older psychiatrists or, or younger people who have talked to older psychiatrists, you might hear some mention of pimazide being particularly helpful. That was apparently how some people thought back in the 90s. Um, and Opler, for example, spoke highly of pimazide, uh, saying that based upon various kinds of case reports, it seemed to be better than others. And I just throw these in for pharmacological interest. Opler pointed out that pimazide might differ from other medicines in being very minimally blocking norepinephrine signals. And at, block, at being a calcium channel blocker, and at being an opioid receptor antagonist. So these are actually interesting properties of pimazide. And two weeks ago, I did a talk on calcium channel blockers. So th that seems to be, psych we'll say, psychotropically interesting. However, the um, Cochrane data that I showed you in the slide previous of this concluded no data regarding pimazide support or refute its use. So it's an uh, open question in the Cochrane mind. Manshrek and Kahn, in 2006, they looked at all published papers that they could find from 94 to 2004, and they commented that all of them were basically case series or case reports and no randomized clinical trials. They did try to extract from all the papers that they could find some, some information. I think this is promising, or at least is optimistic, of, in terms of general outcome, um, 49% of people with delusional disorder eventually achieved the goal of recovery, and 40, another 40% 40 got significantly better. Only 10% of the people reported didn't get better. So you can say that the prognosis is relatively favorable. It, there's just not enough to make. I looked at these data. They, they tried to define outcome by delusional type. It's for what it's worth with very little sample size, it seems that persecutory delusions are perhaps the least recoverable, whereas somatic delusions um, and perhaps, you know, four out of five um, responding are maybe favorable. And this table in these, in the category of the, you know, the data that we have, albeit limited, does speak well of pimazide with, um, recovery 29 out of 59 people 29 achieved recovery 17 improvement 13 not typical other typical drugs did okay second generation drugs did between recovery and improvement they did okay in terms of failure it's a good ratio toward improvement or recovery so there's that um that was a 2006 publication 2020 muñoz negro and colleagues looked at, the, again, they, they, they extracted every paper that they could find, and then they tried to look at clinician rating of response, and they came up with this. They found 437 individuals to get data from. They concluded that first generations were maybe somewhat slightly better than second generation drugs, and it seemed to be more effective when given to hospitalized patients, which to me makes sense because these are people with more severe illness. They might get better with medication. And there are the data. Pimazide had good response of 49%, but keep in mind, a lot of that was very old data when Pimazide was kind of culturally seen as the better thing. So it could be that more people got Pimazide, but uh, but no. Anyway, 40, Pimazide somewhat did okay. Haldol and Risperidone and Olanzapine had, you know, 33% with being good response in clinician eyes. So there's that. And then the most recent 
It's a different flavor of study, but I think it's informative. This came from looking at Swedish medical records. Scandinavian countries, as you know, are great places for doing this kind of research because it's a single healthcare system with a universal medical record. So it is possible in Sweden and other um, Nordic countries to literally find everybody in the country that received a diagnosis of delusional disorder, which they did. And, and they identified 9,000 cases of delusional disorder being diagnosed. They then, through chart review, followed up the outcomes and the average period of follow-up was just under five years. The outcome measures were whether they were hospitalized because of a experience of psychosis or whether they got on disability. Another thing with, with Sweden, I can tell you from having lived there, is that um, it's, a, it's a universal pension system as well. So you, you can easily match you can find everybody who had delusional disorder and you can easily find how many of those wound up declaring disability or being on disability pension. So they had some solid outcomes and then they simply looked at what were the medicines that were prescribed between diagnosis and those outcomes. So that's where it is, I think, handy. Um, hazard ratios, meaning that if it's be below one, then the odds of not experiencing the outcome is better than, how to phrase this, we'll just say a number is lower than one mean good. And the farther below one you are, the better the, 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 better the, the result. So any antipsychotic treatment reduced the, the hazard or the occurrence of hospitalization by about half. Long-acting injectables did very well, reducing it by two-thirds. Clozapine did extremely well. Uh, Aripiprazole, and olanzapine. These were the top performance of, to be clear, all those 9,000 people studied over the length of time and looking at the question, did prescription of any of these drugs during that interval prevent hospitalization? So these would be the winners in that way of looking at numbers. Um, I think it's, and to cl clarify, this was all people registered or all people studied regardless of whether they were on disability or not at the beginning of the entry of the, the study and the outcome being, we'll say, the worst case hospitalization. I think it's also very interesting to look at the people, the subset of individuals in their sample that were not on disability at the beginning of the observation period and when, when the outcome was being coming on disability. So it's a less severe out, bad outcome and it's happening among those that weren't disabled or rated as disabled prior to. So with that being the lens through which we're looking, again, any antipsychotic reduced the hazard ratio in a statistically significant way. Clozapine, again, was the top performer, followed by any long-acting injectable drug, followed by aripiprazole, followed by a mixture of antipsychotic drugs. Cotiapine, olanzapine, and risperidone numerically were all below one, but the, the error bars crossed one, so, statistic, so numerically good, but statistically technically not significant. Uh, and very, 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 very few data exist on whether antidepressants or mood stabilizers or lithium can be of any use. I'm surprised that there are so few papers that address that, but they did look at those categories of other medications and none of them had a signal for preventing somebody not on disability, moving to disability during an observation period. And friends, that's it. I'm sorry to say, I wish that there were, um, you know, better data to be more clear about what we ought to do. And there's just not. This is, again, the problems being it's a relatively uncommon condition. And for who knows what reasons, it's just not attracted a whole lot of research attention. So this is about as good as we get. No randomized controlled trials, nothing but case reports, case series, or chart review things. Um, it does seem that we don't, if you start it off as pessimistic that people with delusional disorder don't get better, the case report data suggests that they might somewhere between, you know, half or more will get um, good response with medication. And the question of a question really also spectacularly not well addressed is whether clozapine 
can be helpful for people with delusional disorder who don't get better with antipsychotic drugs. And there's there's just like four case report papers that are published that talk about clozapine use in delusional disorder. And then you have the data from Sweden that suggests that it may work. So clozapine, you know, tentatively seems to be helpful. And I don't know, we don't have data from the paper, what possessed the doctors in Sweden to prescribe clozapine to the people with delusional disorder. But clearly it seems to have a strong protective benefit in conversion disability or in winding up in a hospital. So it's, I think, something to consider for now. And I will join the researcher who emailed me and say, this is an understudied disorder and um, we need to do better as a profession.